This episode of the Speech Science Podcast was brought to you by Presence Learning. If you're considering a career in teletherapy, you need a therapy platform built specifically to deliver therapy and assessments remotely. Exactly. Therapy Essentials, which includes the Presence Learning Therapy Platform, is so much more than your average video conferencing tool. It was designed by clinicians for clinicians specifically to deliver therapy and assessments online. The Presence Learning Platform features a content library full of games and activities sortable by age and interest to personalize your therapy and keep your clients engaged. And don't forget speech language assessments from top publishers. For more information and to start your free trial, go to PresenceLearning.com and then click on our platform. The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect the the policy policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please Please contact contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's transmitting a thought from one person to another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. The back and forth between two people. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas or thoughts or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science, episode number 159. I'm Matt Hott, a speech and language pathologist working in a middle school here in Ohio and also in the home health care situation working with adults uh, in stroke and dementia rehab. Joined, as always, by our... Oh, who am I going to talk to first? Our adult medical expert up in the state of Wisconsin, Marie Severson. Hey. Hello. Our PTSD SLP working in the good old state of Florida. It is Rachel Arshambo. Hello, hello. Hello. And our pediatric expert in the great state of Texas, Michelle Wintering. Hi, Matt. Hi, y'all. One day I'm going to remember everyone's state like bird. And I'm going to surprise you with that one week. I'm excited. Okay. On today's... So am I. <laughs> I don't know what mine is, so please teach oh. me. I don't either. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the thing you should never talk about, they tell you. We're going to talk about your pay and maybe why we need more transparency in our field. We're also going to talk about ableism and a little bit of a uh, social media storm. Thanks to a uh, ASHA lesson on dysphagia. We'll get more into that uh, as well as we got our shout out, our due process and the informed SLP. But we always want to hear from you. Make sure you go to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. And from there, you can email us speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I'm excited to hear from you at home. But first, I want to hear from the wonderful speech science host and i will jump in first and say that the past week has been gorgeous here in ohio i'm on spring break we're recording this on march 17th it was 74 degrees today y'all and i did home care with the sunroof open the windows rolled down and today is the day why i was doing home care because i'm not in the office i also got to take my boys uh to a movie and bowling so it's been a week Marie, how has your week been? Well, I have also been enjoying home care with the nicer weather, and mm-hmm. I cracked my <laughs> my window roof as well. Um, and uh, my roof window, what do you call that again? Sunroof. Thank you, Moon my roof? sunroof. I never use it, but <laughs> um, so I cracked my sunroof for the first time. It was incredible, and um, I went out for a few walks, and I took a bit of a social media pause, so that helped me refocus and. I'm still laughing about the roof window because that was a really good circumlocution. (laughs) Yes. I'm, oh my gosh, I'm constantly doing that, especially when I'm tired. So, Um, but yeah, the weather's been incredible here. It just makes everything better. And it's great driving around with the sun shining in. 
Hey, and just so that everyone, you know, if you don't follow the news, there is nothing pressing happening in the world that our Congress has got together and voted to keep daylight savings time. At least Senate did. Don't know about the House. But hey, nothing else happening in the world that we could vote on that. Yep. That's right. <laughs> I just learned for the first time. And, and tell me if I'm the only one. But I say it's daylight savings time. Like I, I, I realize well. it. I put an S in there. There's no S. It's right. incorrect grammatically, I guess, but I think it's very regional and it's become just how it's said. But you always yeah. have those grammar people that are like, there's no S. There's no S. Mm -hmm. Also, they did this before in 1973, I believe. And it, it lasted four go. months. It lasted four months before they repelled it because there were more children being hit by cars on their way to school. Correlation does not equal causation. Well, that's why they repelled it. <laughs> but it also could have been that Nixon left office. Repealed it? Repelled, repealed, whatever. Yeah. I think it's they probably both. Against it. <laughs> right. This is true. <laughs> Because of that, I'm skipping you, Michelle. Rachel, how was your Sounds week? Sounds good. <laughs> you I can skip me had on this one. pretty good week. Um, next week is spring break. Um, Saturday, I went to go see Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills, Nash Young with my dad. He's 80 years old and sounds incredible. Had a great time. And then the next morning, had a last minute a uh, ticket to see the Broadway show Frozen in Florida. I cried the entire time. It was beautiful. It was so well done. I highly encourage anyone to see it. It was just pretty. So, so well done. I would well love done. to see that. Really good. So without giving anything away, because I love being surprised on theater stuff, was like Olaf a puppet or was it like a man in a suit? It was a puppet with a man in like frozen attire behind him. Oh, it was okay. so, so like they do at Disney. Though. Yes, absolutely. It was so so good. Um, they did have some Lion King type. That's what um, I was wondering. Was it yes. kind of Lion King esque? They did. That was really cool when that character walked in. Everyone you, and it, this was the first show that it was like a lot of kids were there. So some of them were Aww. seeing Broadway for the first time. I had a two year old next to me. It was the funniest thing. One of the lines in the show was about um, looks like we have a dysfunctional family. The girl laughed her head her head off and the two parents looked at each other and they were cracking up like she has no idea what that means. And it was just seeing the joy of watching the <laughs> show come to life. They loved it. If you loved how they did that, I saw a sneak peek for the Winnie the Pooh show that they're putting on Broadway with their puppets. Oh, gosh, and, I need to find this because my uh, son loves Winnie the Pooh right now. Yeah, they've got like Tigger and Pooh, kind of like how you described uh, Olaf with someone walking behind them, but they're the, the little puppeteers. So awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed your uh, off Broadway, Broadway on tour, whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Michelle, now to you, <laughs> now the rude you one. You made me wait. <laughs> Was your week I'm fine with that. Speaking of Winnie the Pooh, actually oh. went to the library yesterday for this um, mad science event where it was basically a presentation, of, you know, a kid program for three years old and up. And they did various science experiments and um, showed the kids dry ice and all different sorts of things. So my son had a ball with that. And we went to get some books right after. And I hear this huge thud because he like runs around the bookshelf away from me. And I'm dreading how many books did he just pull off of a shelf? And I come around and he's trying to pick up this massive book that's probably three and a half inches thick. And it's the complete collection of Winnie the Pooh, right? The whole heavy set original, Aww. all of the books from Winnie the Pooh that when you watch the little episodes and they show the books and the characters move in the book, that's what it is. And so this is his first actual chapter book, I'll call it, that he wants to to look at. And it still has pictures, too. And so we've started reading a chapter a night. And he's so excited about it because Yay. he's seen some of the Winnie the Pooh movies and shorts. So that's pretty fun. And then um, I, I feel like I could start a major... Uh, who I, I'm curious your guys' thoughts. Are you the kind of people who, on your phone, do you have all those red <laughs> notifications on your phone, or are you the person who has to have it clear, like oh, for I'm your cleared for sure? Yeah, I'm Marie. How about you, Rachel? I'm somewhere in the middle now. I used to have that, and now I just can't keep up, and it bothers me. But I don't do anything about it. 
Matt. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Like, I so my I had to redo my work phone, and the person helped setting it up was like, "How do you have eight thousand unread emails?" Okay, so see like, you you get uh, where I'm going. Yes, uh, um, it's because I get four hundred in a day. That's yes. how I got eight thousand. So can I show you something? Because oh, normally no. mine says more like Matt. I haven't gone to yeah. eight thousand. That's kind of impressive. But um, four thousand. I was at four thousand. <laughs> Because oh, no. especially since my daughter was born, I just haven't deleted emails. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, oh my god! And you would be really proud of me though. I know Marie's like sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> like I will do it for you, Matt. Can you do it for me? Because I, I yes. don't like doing it. I was on my computer last night and I deleted over 4,000 emails. And do you nice. see that? Do you see there's Ooh, yeah, so clean on my email right there. It's like a fresh start. It is. It, it does kind of feel like a fresh start. And now I kind of want to keep it that way. So I all the 25 spam, not spam, but, you know, marketing and whatever mm-hmm. else emails, because I've had this mm-hmm. email address for years that I got today. Every one of them I unsubscribe to. That's why it's still hey, empty. That's good. Go. It's a new year. New I'm year. proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. You know what? I, I have a question and I feel like um, this would have been a good um, mic question. Um I've, de- I've been doing this thing where I always clear my notifications, but if there's something that I need to get back with someone about, like if, if it's like a message or if it's something on Instagram and I want to make sure I respond, I'll leave it. But what happens is, is then it becomes background noise and then I just stare at it for several days and then I never address it for like a week. So I'm definitely like an either or, like I either address it right away or I'll like hold on to it and wait. And I feel like that's an executive functions problem. <laughs> like I can't that, figure that out. I do that so with the, texting. For me, it doesn't bother me. Like I, those notifications legit do not bother me. Oh. <laughs> it's a reminder of my failure. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. I was just saying I do that with text that... I leave it unread like and I don't have the red receipts or anything so it's not like oh if I click on this they'll know that I read it and didn't get back to them I leave it so that I will get back to it but then in the, like a couple yes. days go by and I'm like I can't get to it right now like so it I don't but know but then I'm it's the question the of if you wait too long then is it rude to respond right it's like well right. now it's been too long so I don't know this happens a lot and I'm sorry to all my friends that have to go through this <laughs> same I would say I don't think it's rude maybe I'm uh, I'm not missing maybe I'm missing that social cue but I usually will re- if I forget I'll mentally respond to something like a text and think oh yeah I wrote them back and then so- I'll check my phone and realize I didn't so I'll say hey I thought I wrote back to you Sorry, here's my response. So I I used to work on texting social rules with my high schoolers. Um, and this is something that I really enjoy doing. But I always taught them that a text is not urgent. A call mm. is much more urgent. So if someone answers a call, that's a way for you to get an answer very quickly and you can move on with your day. When it's a text, they should not expect an answer right away from you. If they would like a, a response that's quicker, they need to call you. So I love that. So I love that to, like, too, but I, I do think there's a generational difference with that. You go a decade younger than us, and I'm sure your students. Mm-hmm. Like I think of my in-laws who I have, I have siblings in law who are significantly younger than me. And I don't think they have the same perspective on response times. No, my sister's 22 and I don't know if she's ever answered a phone call from me. And That's I just true. learned that it's not, it's not something to get offended about. She no. just won't answer the phone. Yeah. Um, so I'm about to make all of you guys super cringe or shudder or whatever. But since the age of like 16, I hardly ever answer the phone and purposely send it to voicemail. So then I can hear why the person called me. And then I can determine if I need to call them back. And if they don't leave a voicemail, then I assume that I don't need to call them back because it wasn't important. Do you have your closest circle of people, though, that you would answer a phone call from? My wife. Okay, your wife. And I'm guessing probably a couple key other people. Maybe. Okay. See, (laughs) that I think makes sense. There's that, you know, our radius. But I mean, uh, like, yeah, uh, like, I I picked it up, like I said, when I was like 16 or 17, because I was listening to a radio host talk about doing it. And I went, Oh, my gosh, that is so much simpler than answering the phone and being upset. 
every day about why I need to talk to this person for 20 minutes for no reason. It's true. And yeah, yes, I you, teach social yeah. skills and pragmatics mm -hmm. to other kids. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hey, we have a listener email, and it is Rhiannon Anderson, who was our guest a couple weeks ago, or I guess a couple months ago now. Oh, yeah, when, when we she talked hopped about on. Her. Yep. Yes, and she wrote us a lovely email. It says, hi, M, 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 and R. Aww. Now, I want to see if there are more people in our field with M names. Her cohort of 35 has nine M first names. Wow. So correlation or causation? I'm not sure. <laughs> Do M names go into speech therapy? This is funny. Now I want to go look back at our class list. Um, she says that uh, she was listening to episode 156 where we forgot her name and she put it in her email again. It is Rhiannon. We are so sorry, Rhiannon. I'm sorry, Rhiannon. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for listening. You're probably listening again. We'll remember but, you. But she says that our conversation really helped her reshape her cover letter and her resume. And she attached it. Uh, and would like uh, Michelle for you to maybe give it a look. So I will forward that over to you. I can do that. All so, right. So Rhiannon, that is awesome. And she gave us a suggestion on something to talk about for a future show. So we're going to hold on to that and maybe do that next week or in a couple weeks. All right. Thanks, Thanks Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Yeah. So now we're never going to forget Rhiannon's name. Never. Nope. Isn't and that's a song? I know that there's, and there's research, isn't, there's legit research on this or, or data collection, I should say. Uh, and there are more, for example, men therapy. named Dennis who are dentists statistically. Uh, yes. Statistically. What? Really? There's yeah. actually, there's a documentary about it. People who are last names between or first names, names, names and fields. Yeah. Yes. I need to watch Can't this. Remember. Yes. So now we got to figure out if there's more M's in speech therapy. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. My mom oh. was starting to think it was, you know, something she needed to change with my name. That <laughs> <laughs> here you Rachel, go. Rachel, what would your what would Here's your an name article. be if, if your it name was is an Dennis. M name? So my mom would have named me Daniel if I was a boy. Yes, but if you had to pick an M name, what would your M name be? <laughs> Maeve from Westworld. Ooh, okay. Yes. So love that. I love that. Michelle, yeah. Marie, Maeve, Michael, and Matt. That, that is that my future right off the child's tongue. name. That I've decided my future <laughs> child's name is welcome Maeve. To speak, welcome to speech science with mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was a little bit of a dad joke. I'll take that. Hey, oh write gosh. to us, speech science podcast at gmail. Dot com. Hey, we have our SS Pod shout out as an opportunity to recognize people doing something awesome. And this week, the shout out goes to Claire Heslop and Claire Whitaker over in uh, England, Great Britain. Uh, and they are doing the world's first online speech therapy club to address language delays. And it is speechclub.com. Okay. So they have divided speech therapy into 18 different modules and you can subscribe and they will teach you how to do some of our therapy games, I guess, at home with your child. So it's really that parent education part. That is a wonderful, cool way of taking what we do and kind of uh, monetizing it. So I love it. Very cool. All right. What is that, Marie? Oh, nominative determinism is the hypothesis that people tend to gravitate toward areas of work that fit their names. Ah, huh. I think we talked Wikipedia about this probably 50 episodes ago at some point because the article I pulled up looks familiar. <laughs> Mar Marie dropped like just nominative determinism into the chat. Like I was going to have any idea what and we were talking goes, about. Like, what? what's that, Marie? I try to keep it light. I appreciate it. On the flip side of no, life, we have, determinism. we have the SS pod due process. That is your opportunity to bring something to us uh, for the group discussion to kind of maybe come up with an idea or say if you're right or wrong. This is coming from Chris from California. Uh, it says, is it worth breaking my contract to get out of a school job early or should I stay in my position till the end of my contract? Is it a contract employee or a school school board? It doesn't. It didn't really give a whole okay. lot. Okay, so. so I I really don't think 
I'm a big believer that you need to get out of a situation that that is not good. Um, being in my new role um, as a speech program specialist, I have seen contracts leave day one when they are signed on for six weeks um, and they leave us high and dry. And you know what? I feel like that's sometimes the nature of the beast, that that is part of the contract that they are able to, you know, leave. We do have school board people that have left, you know, mid-year something like that, but that's not necessarily a contract. There's some discussion whether um, you need to put in two weeks notice or anything like that. I think people are allowed to change jobs. What I have heard from some people is, you know what, they're not going to work for the district again because they've done this. Mm -hmm. Whether I think anyone's actually following up on that, I'm not sure. Um, I think if you're not in a good situation, I would definitely consider leaving, uh, breaking your contract. I'm not sure what kind of contract you have, but from what I've seen, a, a contract employee for a for a district per se um, is able to leave with relatively no penalty. I know I in Ohio. Oh, sorry, Michelle. I was just going to add that I'm guessing if you're writing in about this, that there is probably mm -hmm. a good personal reason that you are seriously considering leaving this job because I don't think that's something that most people take lightly um, and seek out advice on. So. Um, yeah, you, you have to to weigh what's right for you, your family, your mental health, your well-being, other career opportunities. And I know that that means sometimes leaving a situation in a difficult way, but um, do what you got to do. And I know in Ohio that schools have the opportunity to hold your school licensure till the end of your school contract. So if you are on a one-year contract with your school district, and you leave in December, they can hold it till the end of the school year. They can also release it if they want to. Meaning you can't work district. in a school? Is in that another what you mean? school because you won't be able to use your license until June. And some but you school could work in a it. different setting. Correct. You could do health care, home care, or private practice. You just can't work in another school district till the end of the contract. I'm curious if that's similar in other states. I wasn't familiar yeah, with I don't that. Know. So, um, but my thought is, I'm sorry, Rachel, no. I was going to say, my thought is like, if you're leaving the school contract for more money, then I'm completely against leaving because that's part of the, the risk you take working in a school that you're kind of committing to that nine month position. But if it is because of out of control caseload or terrible supervisors or terrible support, then Rachel, I think you're hundred percent spot on. You have to take care of yourself mentally, but if it's because, you know, you're working in a school for 58,000 and the hospital offers you 65,000, it, you know, it's, I, I feel like that's kind of the risk we all run when we take these school contracts, but I, yeah, that's kind of where I sit. It's tough because, you know, I've heard, uh, I think people prioritize loyalty with, with jobs and everything. And I saw my dad get screwed out of, mm -hmm. you know, he worked for a pharmaceutical company for 18 years and, you know, that company was bought up by someone and they were like, you know what, we can pay newbies way less and you're just out of the job. So I I'm a big believer that y you are very replaceable. So with that money part, with such a large, you know, 50 to 65 or something like that, I don't know if I would say no to that. Um, I, I feel like you can move, whether it's the nice thing to do, I don't know. I, th I think that's what it comes down to is more manners. Like, should I do this? Should I leave them high and dry when you have the option to do that? There might be some ramifications, whether like you were saying, you might not be able to work within the district for a little bit. Um, that might be a risk you are willing to take depending on what that is, but you have to do what's best for you. You know, I signed a non-compete at a clinic and a, and a hospital I worked at before having worked a lot of different jobs as well. So I, I feel like any setting that you're leaving and you're talking about a school, there may very well be things you really need to consider and make sure you know if you're going to leave. Because some of those non-competes, I don't think schools I've seen this with, but I've heard of non-competes that are a, as the crow flies radius, and that can cover a mm -hmm. lot of ground. Yeah. 
There's they, definitely I, controversy about those non-competes and whether oh, or not absolutely, you can yeah. actually hold someone to that because a lot of them are pretty unreasonable. Especially not so much for our field, but ones I've heard of for um, physicians can be like ridiculous. I worked yeah. in TV and our anchors had non-compete clauses that were like a hundred miles as the crow flies. And the idea behind that is so that someone watching at home, you know, a hundred miles away, it seems like a long distance, but on like a TV signal, it's not that far so that they don't turn on and they lose all those viewers. Hmm. That's very interesting. I think mm -hmm. the blanket advice of don't burn any bridges is really good here. Whatever you do, however you word it, whatever you have to do to do what's right for your life, just make sure that you don't burn bridges. Be polite, be professional, be you know apologetic if you can. But at, at the end of the day, you have to live your life. True. Avoid burnout is... A huge part of avoiding burnout is doing things for yourself and not mm -hmm. for the betterment of this field. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but. It's true. So head to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. And Michelle, while they're on the website, they should be signing up for the new giveaway, right? That's right. If you listened to last week's episode, you heard my interview with Barbara Fernandez, the author of Sis, You Got This. And uh, she is doing a giveaway for us, for all of our listeners. Hop on and sign up for that. It includes a copy of her book and a one-year access to her Speech and Language Academy. So be sure to sign up and check that out. So that is over at speechsciencepodcast.com. Uh, and I believe I've got it set up for it to launch the giveaway when it sh when you log in for the first time and it'll redo that every couple of days as like a pop-up window if not go to the little giveaway tab i like this squarespace guys we're not even getting paid by squarespace but squarespace has made our website so much nicer <laughs> that's great i'm so excited by that hey so let's chit chat about something y'all our first topic is something that they tell us never to talk about. And by them, I mean, it is our bosses that don't want us to talk about our pay. And this kind of came up pretty naturally just in our group chat. I don't remember how the conversation of pay started. I don't remember either. I know, Rachel, you and I were just kind of going back and forth on conversation parts of it. But overall, we have decided that we need to really talk about that transparency what is a good pay rate and yeah i i realized that as soon as i thought about that too pay rate see those are those triggering words so what is a good pay rate how do we know what is a good pay rate and this kind of came up in some other facebook groups as well about certain companies not paying or what they don't want them to pay at certain prices so Let's who wants to kick off the the conversation. All right, go for it, Rachel. OK, now we can all look at her as the bad guy and answer her question. So I actually wrote on my page um, around January when I was ha me and my coworkers as program specialists, you know, talked to our district about raising the salary for school based SLPs. And we gathered information from neighboring uh, school districts, um, other districts in Florida, whether the same size, demographic, everything like that. We said, what are other SLPs getting paid? Um, because part of it, when I look on Facebook and you see someone in California saying they get $200 an hour, and that's an exaggeration, I think, but whatever they're making, and then they go on to a post when someone says, I'm making $30 an hour and say, that's ridiculous and everything like that when they're in Kentucky or something like that. So I think that the discussion that we need to be having is what are regionally based salaries in different settings, whether acute care, skilled nursing, schools, um, and that could be contract employees, that could be school-based employees. Are they on teacher salary? Are they on specialist pay scale? There are so many different factors. And I think I spoke about this episodes and episodes ago about how you have, when I was in high school and I Googled, how much does a does a speech pathologist make Google? The Google machine told me $99,000. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. 
Um, when in reality, that's taking into account New York salary, that's taking into account California salary, that's also taking into account people from other settings within my state that might make that much money, or they're working multiple jobs in order to get, a, you know, $100,000, something like that. So we need my position here is I think we need to be transparent about our salaries, um, especially as people that were brought up saying, we don't talk about salaries. That's an inappropriate thing to say, because like I said in the chat, you have people that are interviewing for positions and you have a new SLP coming in saying, I want $80 an hour. And the interviewer gets offended saying, I don't even make that. And realistically, that is kind of what we should be making towards that, you know, in a certain area. But this, this conversation about pay needs to be done in order to see what other people are making so that we can make change in the areas that we need to be brought up. That's, that's how I feel. I feel very strongly about this. I, Rachel, I like hearing that you had, I guess, took the opportunity, made the opportunity with some other SLPs. Was it just SLPs who presented? It was the other program specialist to our, our ESE district saying, this is, you know, why we are losing so many people that we're competing with these other districts that are paying much more. So I think you guys made that opportunity for yourselves to have that conversation with people who could potentially influence your pay or the pay of people in your district. And the biggest thing that I, when I see these conversations on social media or talk to other SLPs and therapists about it, where I kind of get frustrated, right, is because, um, one, there are certain areas of speech or even areas of the country or people older than us who um, don't want to talk about their salary, don't yes. want to talk about what they make. So needing that, we need that transparency. We need people to be willing to say, hey, like, this is what I make over here. This is what I make over here. So two miles away, they're making 10000 more dollars annually. Um, and then also, we need to be able to kind of move beyond this blanket advice that I see sometimes, which I get frustrated reading, that says, you can't accept less than X dollars yes. an hour. Mm -hmm. You do not accept less than this salary because I, I I don't even know how to explain it exactly, but it it frustrates me because I'm like, you are assuming that anyone sitting in a job interview can walk away and have another job that, that they can safely for themselves, for their family, for whatever reason, turn down that job or potentially not get that job because they're demanding more pay than that place is willing or able to provide. And so I, I don't think we can just say some blanket number because it is so regional and there are other factors and people accept jobs for various reasons. If you're a new SLP, I know myself, especially, it's not just an experience why you're not asking for a higher pay. It might be because you legit need a job. You need to pay off loans. You need to pay your rent. You need to, um, you know, move out of your parents' house. You don't have a second income, whether that be a spouse or whether that be a second job or savings in your bank account from previous employment. So there's, there's just a lot of factors, I guess. And Is then I think of, oh, sorry. I just, um, I think of myself with sitting in job interviews, knowing if we're going to be stationed somewhere for a limited period of time. Um, I only have so much time to get a job to really like mm -hmm. dive into that job. So I'm not going to push back as much as maybe I would in another yes. situation on a pay that they offer because there's already enough that is against me, st kind of stacked against me as a military spouse sometimes. Not all employees are like this, but there are people, and I know for myself or for other military spouses, where we know based on the vibe or what they said in the interview that we are not their top candidate and we are not getting this job and big factors because they don't see us as a long-term employee in their mind. In the school, in the school setting, is Florida a union state? We are able to and have they, unions and I'm a member of the okay. teachers union for my district. Is Wisconsin, do you know, Marie, do the schools have unions up there? Uh, we had like a big union busting issue in like okay. 2008. Yeah. It's, it's not great for us. In terms of unions, I don't know a whole lot about how it's what it's like in the schools, if I'm being honest. Um, but there's definitely nothing like that for healthcare workers. Right. No. And then is Texas, do the schools down there have unions? Ooh, I'm, I haven't been in a school here. That's a really okay. good question. 
the the reason I ask is because Ohio, we are, we have the Ohio Education Association and all the little local groups. But part of that is we also have the Ohio negotiated, um, the Ohio State Employment Relations Boards, and it has all of the collective bargaining agreements across the state. So you can very quickly and easily identify what any other school-based SLP is making. So it does allow a little bit more transparency. And because mm -hmm. of that, I'm very open and willing to state that at year 10, and I have to actually look on this stupid contract, at year 10, I supposedly make 73 a year. So that is not that 99 that you were told, Rachel, but that is that open transparency that if somebody is looking to go somewhere else, and you are in what specific, that's in the school district. I'm uh, in a school district. Okay. So in, in Florida, what was just done, we are on a teacher pay, pay scale, which Same here. we previous, I think two years ago, the starting teacher salary was $43,000. The governor bumped it up just two years ago to 47.5. Then... SLPs get a stipend for their masters. They get a stipend for the SLP position, which is like $45 per check. And then they get um, a C's stipend for ASHA. So all in all, my salary is 53,100 something. And I am making more than some of the teachers that are on year 10 because they did not get bumped up on the new salary and they've been on a salary freeze for the past eight to 10 years. So there's a huge discrepancy in the pay. Um, and I, I don't think I will ever be making in the seventies, which is, you know, sad. Come to Ohio. I, uh, right. I, I also think we are a field uh, I, dominated by women. This is, this is what uh, the 91%, 96%, something like that. 96.6. Okay. So I think as a field that is a majority women, um, we, we have not been told how to negotiate. Um, and in our, in the school districts, you cannot negotiate salary. You it's can't. it's a yep. set salary, right? So I think many of us are on the, on that type of salary, but then you go to, you know, a home health company that does have room to negotiate and we are not trained to do that. Um, I, I also always take the CF standpoint of when I came out of school, like Michelle was saying, I was like, I need a job. I need to start going right away. But the fact that no one was around me saying that's not an okay contract price or that's way lower than regionally you should be getting, you need to ask for you know $48 per hour. You need to ask for $50 an hour. Um, this is this is something that we need to be taught about negotiation because I think this is one of the reasons we still have low pay in many settings. It is a bit of a free for all in the healthcare setting, sort of like what you were alluding to, Rachel, because there isn't something like a teacher pay scale. We don't have anything. It, nobody knows honestly, and the the only way that I figured out what people were getting paid in my area was by working at a bunch of different places and then hmm. asking my friends and feeling comfortable to have those conversations because there's, I mean, it's just very, I mean, nobody knows and it's, it's very secretive sometimes, or like, and I'm talking about the companies themselves, of course. how much they can pay you the business. They're going to offer you that. That's the thing with healthcare is they're going to offer you the lowest that you'll take. That's always going to be the first offer. And there isn't like a safeguard against that by saying like, oh, well, we, you know, here's where, here's our scale and this is where you're going to start. I mean, sometimes they'll say they have a scale, like this is where we start our clinical fellows or this is how, where we start people with one to three years. But what ends up happening in healthcare is that new grads end up coming and ask in and asking for more and they either get paid the same or more sometimes than people with experience. Because if you come in low in a company that doesn't give raises, which is really, really, really common in healthcare or small raises, especially with contract companies, you're, you'll just never make it up. And the only way that you can make it up is by going somewhere else. And there mm -hmm. was a great podcast episode, I think it was Speech Uncensored, where they talked about negotiating and the research showed that the most effective form of negotiation was getting a counter offer from somewhere else. And that's just unfortunate. And I've been in positions to 
really try very, very hard, bring evidence, bring, bring numbers, bring like document everything I've done to try to say, Hey, like I deserve more money than this really small raise. And I have, I have been told that because of the saturation in my area, they, they can't go up because there's so That's many SLPs that if I don't want to work there, then someone exactly. else will work there. No problem. Which is horrible. <laughs> Right. Very, very, very upsetting to have to have that conversation. But that is absolutely the reality, especially in the saturated market. So I think saturation has a huge is a huge factor in healthcare. In my anecdotal experience, no, I re- I really appreciate that perspective because the medical setting. When I came out of grad school, that was my hope was to be in the medical setting, and I found it so difficult. And I think I've talked about this before that. When I applied to these hospitals, they're like, wow, your resume looks so cool. Let's hire you. Let's, when can you get started? I said, well, you need to send me a letter saying that you've hired me so I can get my license. Like they would ask me, where's your license? I said, I don't have one yet until you hire me. Then they would be like, you know what? That's too much work. So they would get someone else that already has their license. So what a lot of contract companies do is they say that they specialize in CFs so that they can get them and they say, oh, we'll handle everything for you, which was very helpful for me getting all that licensure there was no issue with that they handled it for me however i i joined this company saying like you're my last hope starting before the school year starts getting some pay and when you're in grad school for two years you're paying you're gonna start student loans and everything going from no job to a job is a very big increase So I I think a lot of CFs get stuck in settings that they're not really wanting to be. And then they get stuck because the hospitals or medical settings after will say, well, you were in a school working with preschoolers for the past year, like you're, you're out of practice or like we're looking for someone that's been in the medical field. So it's that catch 22 of how does anyone get started here? It was, it's kind of like working in the restaurant industry. You can't get in unless you know anyone and it's exactly. really exactly. difficult. So I, I think one of the ways that we can improve our salary altogether is salary transparency. I, I shout it to everyone. I'm a 51,000. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, that's embarrassing. Like, you know, in, in Florida and that's not, I make sure to say like, this is not poverty line. This is not, I am doing much better than some of my students parents have been and I am just me I do not have kids I have a very expensive doggo (laughs) that requires (laughs) you know but um I I think that we need to engage in salary transparency as a whole um because it's affecting us from making any moves in it when we presented to our district and said look the neighboring district makes about fifteen thousand dollars more and they were like Oh, we didn't really know that, which yes, you did. Like, why are all our SLPs moving over to the next district, even though it's farther away for them because they're making more money? Um, We are also a critical shortage field. How do we pull people in, you know, to, to, how do we do this? So I have Mm. a question and I'm I'm going to, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate, but I'm playing devil's advocate on this. You always do. I know mm-hmm. that's my job as the as Important. the as the DJ host whatever. Are we? How do I put this? Are we complaining about the wrong thing? So my question is: Is that yes? We all agree that we should be paid more, but if the money that is reimbursing for our services doesn't increase we find ourselves in a position where uh marie as you said the you know f- the the best way to negotiate is to go get another job offer and to go somewhere else so you either force yourself to work for a bigger company that has other revenue streams or you cuz i cuz i'm not sure how this works and marie you've got a private practice and we were kind mm-hmm. of talking a little bit in the group chat the reimbursement rate I saw from 2020 was what, $80? And it's just gone down from there. Yep. Has it really? Yep. So that's for Medicare, right? And that's for Medicare. Medicare Yes. Yeah. So how do, are we arguing about the wrong thing? If that makes sense as a field, are we too focused on Mm -hmm. 
the third party transition and not where they're coming from with the money, if that makes sense. It makes total sense, Matt. What you're saying is, could we be putting our effort and energy towards something like overhauling Mm -hmm. Medicare reimbursement, you know, advocating for better Medicare reimbursement, which will in turn potentially increase our salary? It's hard for, well, do I believe that that would be the best way to go about it? I don't think so, because then you are relying on the business to initiate increasing salaries based on that reimbursement and it would take years. But I also hear what you're saying where that is a major factor. Reimbursement in healthcare is a major factor. Medicare part A, not so much. So if you're like you're in a hospital, although it depends on what kind of a hospital, are you on a, are you in a a hospital owned by a contract company? Are you in a nonprofit hospital? The VA? I mean, there's so many, every single different setting has different reimbursements and, uh, that's what makes it really, really difficult. I hear what you're saying. So Matt, you're because, saying, like, you're oh, saying no, you're saying that like, how can we pay someone more when the reimbursement is only this much? So yeah, because like if I own a speech therapy practice and I charge seventy five dollars and I use the ASHA big, is that what it's called, the big bill? Super bill. Super bill. I use the ASHA super bill, which is. I give it to my patient, my patient takes it to their insurance and they get reimbursed for it. And I charge $75. Well, if I pay Marie $50 a visit, not $50 an hour, $50 a visit, because I'm only making $75 a visit, that leaves me $25 per visit to pay other staff, to run the building, to pay myself, to advertise. And obviously, these are all things that I don't do on a daily basis, so I'm I'm scraping there. Or do I pay Marie thirty five dollars, and now that gives me forty dollars to maybe hire a business manager to handle a few more things? I don't know what the right answer is there because then if I give my patient a hundred and fifty dollar bill to go get reimbursed, am I losing a patient? That's very interesting, Matt. I think that um, I think that outpatient clinics are getting pressed the most with the reimbursement issues because they're su- the insurance will only reimburse X amount, or you know Medicare and will only yeah, reimburse they, X amount. If so you see your medical bills, it's like that. You have to find another way. So does that mean more product increased productivity for the workers? Does that mean? cutting costs elsewhere. I don't know. I don't own like a larger outpatient private practice, but I know exactly what it would mean if I were to pay someone to see patients for me, because it's a relatively small amount of money that you get paid per CPT code. I don't think that all facilities are subject to the same issue. And I think that there are a lot of CEOs making a lot of money and they keep making a lot of money every year. A lot of for-profit healthcare. I think that's a big issue. Um, I think that there there hasn't been enough pressure, I don't think. I think that we are we are helpers. We want to do the best for patients. We need to stay focused on the patient, you know, always stay focused on the patient. We're a team. I think that sometimes that that breeds a culture where we're willing to sacrifice what is the most important to us, including living comfortably without stress, just to continue working in, in a culture like that. And I, you touched on something that just made me think, Marie, of this idea that our field being a helping field, a service field of some capacity, it, both in healthcare as well as in education, that, you know, I remember trying to negotiate. It wasn't even a negotiation, but pay scale, for example. So one job that I had out of grad school, I was a state employee and we were on a pay freeze. I was not informed of that at hire. And so that's my own naivety, too, for not researching that at that point. But I was told what my salary would increase to based on a few more credits that I needed to hit the next step on that scale. I take my credits into HR, right, after I complete them a year later, and I'm told, oh, well, we're, we're on a pay freeze. And so here I am, unable to see any change in my salary the entire time I work there. And just like Rachel talked about, Um, you know, when 
they hire in someone after you with the same amount of experience they're hired in at their experience level. And I remember even being told when I asked, like, hey, I know neighboring districts pay X, Y, and Z. I understand we're on a pay freeze, but is there any way to support keeping people here, especially if you're in a setting that needs specialized training or certain populations you're working with that need more certifications to work with that it can be such a challenge in this helping field to feel okay advocating for any sort of change in that pay or change in what's available. Cause I, I it just stands out to me being told, Oh, well, you know, people don't work here for the pay. And I'm like, that's mm-hmm. true. I get that, you know, but at some point I have to pay my rent. And at some point I have to pay off my loans and I have to take care of myself too. Oh, I just find that so unrealistic. And I think it, I think it's a it's a, a problem that we need to fix the idea that oh, I'm getting in my own soapbox here, but the idea that we're not working for a paycheck. We abso- that's what everyone is working for a paycheck. If nobody needed money, people would be artists or maybe they'd be working f- four days a week with a three day weekend. I mean, I just think it's unreasonable for for a business to act as though money isn't the main driver, especially when you have six years of potential gra- uh, student loans to be paying off. And I think that's, I'm, I'm very shocked that speech therapists are paid on the same scale as teachers with that graduate student loans looming over them. I just think that's really shocking. Um, Yeah, that's a, I got to think about that one. When I had uh, talked in the chat with you all, I I had said, I, I wonder if there's a calculator that says how much someone should be making regionally depending on um, cost of living and things like that with your profession, how much you should be making. I don't know if there's one specific. I know there are attempts to gather um, on social media, different salaries and different settings where you're located, all this stuff. But I, I think of I'm in South Florida, which basically the housing, there are not enough houses here. The cost of living is exceptionally high. And I cannot live, you know, it in the town that I was teaching in, I could not afford anything there. I could not rent there, anything like that. So there are many places around the country that this is happening, that their own teachers cannot live in the town that they work. So I I wonder, uh, and I think Matt had put into the chat that there is some sort of calculator, which I need to look at more in depth, but I don't know how they're going to say, oh yeah, um, Rachel is in South Florida and should be making around this at a high school. Like, I, I hope that they have that available. So it's it's the nerd wallet. And what you do is you put in where you're at and where you want to move to. And then you can kind of compare it. So, for example, Rachel, I'm going to give you a couple cities in Florida and you tell me which one's close to you. Okay. Uh, Cape Coral, Fort Myers. Nope. Dayt- Daytona. Nope. Fort Lauderdale. That's me. I was going to say, is that perfectly you or close to you? Perfectly me. Okay. So comparing to, I live in Cincinnati and what I make right now before taxes is a number. And it says that I would have to make, so I'm, you know, up here between schools and home healthcare, I make about 112. It says I would need to make 140 down in Fort Lauderdale to maintain my current living ability. And it says a two bedroom home in Ohio, in Cincinnati is 968 in Florida. Holy crap, $2000 a month. And the medium home, oh my god. Medium home price here in Cincinnati is 267 versus the 526 in Fort Lauderdale. Oh yeah. wow. So it's really I mean I wouldn't I can't buy in this market. I can't do any of that. I've been renting the same place for five years. Whoa. I love that. I love this apartment. But at the same time, I'm so concerned that my landlord one day is going to be like, all right, we're raising the rent to be, you know, at the same level as around you. And I'm not going to be able to live here anymore. So that is a concern coming up. And I think that is we have been getting with my district, the teachers union has fought for a 1% raise each year. 1%. That is not enough with the mm. cost of living, which I believe just came out as 7.5, 7, 7, 5, 7, mm-hmm. 7. So yeah, this is not enough to keep up with the, the cost of living. And 
we need to be advocating for at least that in in the form of a raise, if not more. But um, we also need to be getting paid appropriately. Um, we've mentioned other pay scales to be on other than teacher based on our credit. Um, there's a lot of issues here, but I love that there is a calculator like that. I would love to see a speech specific one. Um, <laughs> that that would and that's you know far far away, but I'd love mm-hmm. that to happen. It does say your gas is cheaper than here, but and your entertainment <laughs> choices are cheaper, but your food is 10% higher than Cincinnati and your home is 99% more expensive. Marie, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. It just made me think that, you know, that's be, you know, these issues other fields don't have the same issues. Other fields get a cost of living raise. I know exactly that to be true in my own household and so to kind of see other fields especially other fields that have a two or a four-year degree have already paid off their loans maybe and then getting cost of living raises I just and because speech therapy doesn't have a lot of upward mobility options I just feel like it's just constant sideways mobility so there aren't a whole lot of options here sideways mobility is a good way to put it it's like here take this prn job here take this coaching job Mm -hmm. in a school or supervise this extracurricular for a little small (laughs) stipend or um you know i I feel like that's where the side hustles that people come into and i i I don't want to laugh at this because I find it so frustrating, but I'm mm-hmm. laughing because of that frustration. Mm-hmm. So I apologize for, for the laughter on the microphone. But um, when I see anybody pushing MLMs, right, mm-hmm. who are yeah. often the people who do that, I, a lot of SLPs, I've seen mm-hmm. tons of educators or teachers or especially paraprofessionals in a school setting, in medical settings, um, the aides, the uh, so, you know, the people who are helping us do our job too, administrators and in, in, <laughs> administrative assistants in hospitals. These are the people who are handing me information about their MLM. And I just... I. I get frustrated because I'm like these, if you take somebody making a higher salary, they're not selling an MLM. No, mm-hmm. no, nope. nope. Trying those to are make the, some supplemental income. Those are the ones that are preyed upon because, exactly. Hey, yeah. you're, you're a stay at home mom. You have no income. Want to make some cash on the side by just selling blank. Like it, and you're that is, boss. I mean, I, it's very interesting and I love the documentaries <laughs> on that and it, it's very sad and, and, you know, especially with friends, I'm someone that like will do anything for my friends, no matter how long ago I saw them. So when I get someone that messages me, Hey girly on Instagram, I'm like, Oh no, (laughs) say no, Rachel say no. But it it is true that in these women dominated fields or they prey on women because they know we are not making enough. Do you Mm -hmm. think. And, and, um, this is this is not even a full form thought, so I apologize. But Marie, you had mentioned that in other fields that this is not normally an issue. And mm-hmm. I wonder if it's not an issue in other fields because in our field, it's almost looked at as a necessity. Of ha- so, having multiple jobs? No, 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 no. Like our like our job is considered like a necessity. Okay. Somebody mm. needs it to survive. Okay. So it becomes very hard to put into the money making gears. Because like if you look at what is the money making gears in our field, you've got folks that can highly specialize in certain areas and they can charge more. Because a lot of times, while those areas are super helpful they are maybe not oversaturated or if it is a necessity, it's because it's not saturated or they're not a necessity. So think of like accent modification or uh, a similar or a necessity, but not oversaturated. You've got the fees or you got the mobile MBS groups Right. where in other areas I'm thinking immediately like it it's there's a premium. I can go to somebody that I can get to do my website for cheap, but if I want my website to do X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to pay somebody to get that. I I don't know. It's not a full form thought. It's just kind of a half thought. It makes sense. But I think that if that were the case, would 
wouldn't that be the same problem for doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners? But if we look at it, I mean, yeah, because if you look at it, like, what do you hear about doctors that are the most underpaid? It's the general practitioners and the family docs. They're the ones that are under the most stress. Mm -hmm. They have to see the most amount of patients in a weekly basis. The ones that make the most money? Surgeons. Plastic surgeons. Yeah. Surgeons. I mean, yeah, surgeons, because a lot of times those are necessities, but also we're my daughter we're making sure that we're going to the number one ent at cincinnati children's mm -hmm. so we know there's going to be a little bit more of a premium to go to that one than number 50 on the list but also that kind of goes with what i was saying about those fees or mobile mbs's it's a necessity but there's not a huge amount of people in there so i don't know i mean but they're subject I to, I think it's the reimburse, the, the, the reimbursement issue, the funding for Ooh, the education system, and then reimbursement. Because Matt, if you need a better website and you have the money to buy one or pay for that, then you would. Mm -hmm. But I think right. the issue is there's not always money there. And like I, I recently looked into mobile fees and the reimbursement mm -hmm. rate from Medicare is not very good. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like to invest in $20,000 for a mobile fees equipment. You, It's just, there's nothing, there's no like, lucrative there's not like a a lot of that it's it's a big challenge what i actually think would have to happen and i don't know if this is similar by you all if you're having like a big nursing shortage by you mm -hmm. is this like a national thing there's a there's a major mm -hmm. one around here and the nurses are banding together and saying we're important we do really hard work we we bust our you know what and we don't get paid enough for it and it's not okay and I believe that that's what therapy is going to have to do. And I, I know that physical therapy and occupational therapy feel similarly. I think they have a little bit more of an advantage in some scenarios with for a variety of factors. But I do believe that that's what it would take for speech therapists is everyone. And again, it would probably have to be, I don't know if, if school and healthcare could have the same objectives. I think it would maybe have to be separate. Hmm. Marie, question for you. Do you find, I know myself working in outpatient and in a hospital, talking to friends who are PTs and OTs and friends that I've kept in touch with, the PTs and OTs are often paid slightly higher than the SLPs in those settings. Do you find that, in my experience, I'm curious what your experience has been or anyone else? I have found that to be true in some settings and then not true in others. I, the reasoning that I've heard is because everyone sees PT and OT and not everyone sees speech. So if that's for some reason been a reason and, and I, that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but I, and again, that goes along with the push for like, for example, OTs to maybe provide dysphagia services, because if we can just get OT and PT to just do everything, then we don't have to worry about paying or staffing the speech therapist. I think it's just Oh, it's such a systemic issue, but I don't know that they're making, I mean, if you go on PT Reddit, which I lurk, they have, the, they have very similar issues to us. Very similar. They do. And when I was a graduate intern at the hospital that I was at, um, the PTAs actually were paid more similar, similarly to what the SLPs were being paid. I don't know the PT and OT schedule um, or pay scale, but the PTAs were making essentially the same as the speech pathologists. Well, and I know in regards to a pay scale at a school, for example, um, PTs having a doctorate automatically puts them at a higher pay scale on the teacher pay scale, as well as a lot of OTs have programs have moved to OTD, mm -hmm. a doctorate. I'm, I'm not necessarily advocating that we all need a speech pathology doctorate, no. but it's um, coming down the line. It will. Is it though? Yeah. I don't know. Cool. I don't know. They will. Gosh, can you imagine adding that on top of a clinical fellowship and then having the, the pay well, be the same? I think I just, the clinical fellowship would be a part of it, right? It, I, yeah, we should be already. Be. I mean, that's yeah. another topic that yeah. I can go off of. Why do we have oh, a, yeah. a clinical fellowship when the PTs, they jump out of grad school and they're like, hello, I'm ready to work. And, you know, there's no over uh, supervision, anything like that. And um, audiology does one more year than us. Exactly. So do, so mm -hmm. is yep. physical therapy. It's a DPT. Uh -huh. It's one additional yep. year. So mine was two years, six consecutive semesters. And plus the CFY. 
plus mm-hmm. a CFY. So it, it just mm-hmm. seems like there's inconsistencies when we're always grouped together, yet we are not paid the same. Or, you, you know, it, it, there's so many things that can be changed. I think it, the action is going to have to come from the workers, like Maria is saying, like, the ones that are the nurses, us, we need to be advocating for it. So I am trying to encourage SLPs to share their salaries with each other. If you see Mm -hmm. inconsistencies or just understand what other people are making regionally or, you know, what someone in Ohio is making versus here, maybe I'll move to Ohio and have a nice comfy apartment and my, my quality of, you know, I can take a vacation. I can do this like that. That would be nice. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. I've, I've been watching more... a lot of newsies. Oh, I've been watching a lot of newsies and they say that they're a union just by saying so. But like, realistically, is that where we're going? I mean, this has been banded around on Facebook for the last five, six, seven, eight years of do we need a national speech therapy union? I mean, yeah, you probably need two subsets, but like I worked for a union in New York that was for television people, Mm -hmm. but it's IOTSE and it's the same union that represents theater people. Mm -hmm. So it's in the same area, but they have two different objectives. The IOTSE member on Broadway is worried about hanging lights and not falling off the stage during stage setup. And the IOTSE member working in television is worried about how heavy is this camera and how long do I need to stand holding it? But that union was able to say, both these people we can represent. So, I mean, do we all go newsies? And (laughs) Possibly, because, you know... Asha has been a little hands off on productivity in healthcare, and mm-hmm. I and I get why. I fully understand that it's because there's so much of a variety of different factors that go into every setting. But there's no one that is sticking up for that clinical fellow in a setting that's being asked to do 95 percent productivity and being at times sometimes bullied by management to do more. And there isn't there's no guidance for that. It, it just seems absurd almost that there's no guidance for that. Agreed. I think this has been one of the most intense conversations we've had on the show in a long <laughs> while. And I applaud everyone uh, for one, sticking with us if you're listening at home <laughs> and two, the four of us like willing to tackle it. That's pretty cool. We want to hear from you though. How open are you willing to communicate about your pay rate Head us up, speech science podcast at gmail.com. Coming up over on the other side of the break, we are checking in with the informed SLP. We're going to check in with ableism and disfluency. And then we're also going to check in with uh, maybe a little kerfluffle that Asha may be running with. You're listening to speech science. And now for our regular research review, brought to you by the Informed SLP. The Informed SLP releases a monthly newsletter that brings you plain language reviews of only the newest, most clinically applicable research, keeping you up to date on advances in the field and saving you tons of time. So let's get to it. How much residue is in there? Introducing the vases for fees. This is a review of the articles, Visual Analysis of Swallowing Efficiency and Safety, Phases, a standardized approach to rating pharyngeal residue, penetration, and aspiration during fees, published in Dysphagia. And we've linked the author's version in this review on our website. And the article, Visual Analysis of Swallowing Efficiency and Safety, Phases, Establishing Criterion Referenced Validity and Concurrent Validity, published in the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology, and that article is available to ASHA members. When you're doing a fees and see a small glob of applesauce in your patient's piriforms, it can be hard to know exactly how to describe how much is in there. Mild residue? Moderate? Standardized rating scales like the new VASES can help. 
The vases is used to estimate the amount of residue filling or covering six different areas. It clearly defines each of the areas anatomically and offers rules to help you be consistent when you score tricky situations. Recent studies by Curtis et al. found good to excellent reliability among new clinicians and strong agreement with other fees residue rating scales. In other words, there's evidence that the visual analysis of swallowing efficiency and safety ratings are meaningful. But why develop yet another fees residue rating scale in the first place? We already have a bunch like the Yale, Boston, and Mansoura scales. Three scales that are also standardized and based on anatomical boundaries. What sets the vases apart? First, the vases rates the amount of residue on a continuous scale from 0 to 100%. Rather than using severity categories such as trace, 1 to 5% filling or cover, mild, 5 to 25%, moderate, 25 to 50%, etc. The 100 point scale lets clinicians communicate in, a more, in more detail about the amount of residue they see. For example, vocal folds that are 30% covered wouldn't get lumped into the same moderate category as when they are 45% covered. Also, the vases scores are rated on a visual analog scale, or a VAS. Well, sort of. In the reliability and validity studies so far, participants have moved a slider along a line like the one below to indicate their rating. But Curtis et al. compared raters and perceptions of visual versus numerical scores and found that the two numbers were very close meaning you can feel free to skip the visual part and go straight to documenting a number between 0 and 100 in your report. The vases is also a bit different in what it rates. It is the first fees residue scale to rate the amount of aspiration. While the reliability for aspiration scores wasn't great among trained grad students, Vases scores still probably give your colleagues a clearer picture of what happened than vague impressions of trace or frank aspiration. If you're interested in learning more about the vases, there's good news. The training materials are freely available. This website, which we've linked in this review on our website, has everything you need to start using the vases clinically including the original article, training videos, and even updates to the secondary rules as the research team continues to refine this system. Thanks for listening to this review. If you're interested in more, come visit us at www.theinformedslp.com. Tell us how you put the research into practice or find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Informed SLP. We'll get back into the show in just a moment, but this episode of Speech Science is brought to you by Therapy Essentials, which includes Presence Learning Therapy Platform. It's so much more than your average video conferencing tool. It includes everything you need to securely and effectively deliver speech language therapy and assessments remotely. Michelle, the hardest part of teletherapy for me was always having a robust selection of therapy materials because everything I have is either 2D or the toys. So it's wonderful that Therapy Essentials has a content library full of customizable games and activities that I can personalize for my therapy sessions to keep my clients engaged. Plus, you also, Matt, have the ability to upload your own therapy content and materials. So when you have those things you've already made, you can use those too. Plus a collaborative workspace with multiple camera views so you can see what your clients are doing and they can see what you are doing. And live in-person chat support that can keep you on track. Presence Learning Platform has everything you need to confidently build your teletherapy career. Michelle, if they want to learn more, where do they go? You can start your free trial today and learn more at presencelearning.com. Be sure to click on our platform at the top of the homepage. Thank you.
Welcome back to Speak Science, episode number 159. I'm Matt Hot, joined by Marie Severson. Hey there. Rachel Archambault. Hiya. Michelle Wintering. Hello. Y'all, I found the coolest little thing. Have you guys seen this little kindergarten affirmation phone number? I, I saw, have seen this. I, saw I haven't called it yet. It? I saved the number. Have you called it? No. So it says that if you need a positive affirmation, dial 707-998-8410. So we're going to do something. Oh, gosh. And I'm calling it. Hi. Welcome to Pep Talk. Can you hear it? Our project by I love School. it. Bienvenidos a Pep Talk, un proyecto creado por los estudiantes de West High School. Para un mensaje feliz, presiona 5. Please listen to the following options for encouraging messages. If you're feeling mad, frustrated, or nervous, press 1. If you need it, words of encouragement one, Matt, and life one. advice, press 2. Well, when you're feeling mad, you should take three deep breaths and think of things that make you happy. The thing that makes me happy he is when and, and I think of happy things will happen in the future like going to a friend's house or a cousin's house bye if you're frustrated just take five minutes off if you're frustrated you can always go to your bedroom punch a pillow or <laughs> cry on it <laughs> i love it little positive affirmations from kindergartners so i think we needed uh, that after the last segment <laughs> right 707-998-84 one i'm gonna zero. save that number in my contacts <laughs> oh my gosh and i love it because my kid is a preschooler and uh he talks very similar to that the like i think this I, is how you solve the world problems yes, like, i think i saw something where they're trying to fund it to keep it because oh, they're getting so many calls to this line now you know what i say there's not enough free child labor making me feel better about my <laughs> underpayment in my sp- therapy job so yes let's let's keep those kindergartners underpaid and give me some positive effort. i think it was to keep the phone line accessible <laughs> not, to pay the, not for them to be oh, continually man. recording <laughs> So, anywho, we're going to jump into this article from the ASHA Journal. I'm sorry, the ASHA, what is this in? The Perspectives of Special Interest Groups, correct? I believe so. And the title, I need to scroll all the way back to the top. Interrupting Ableism in Stuttering Therapy and Research uh, by Hope gerlach Hauk and Christopher uh, De Constantino. And there was some discussion. How do you guys, I'm stealing your thunder, Murray. How do you guys describe ableism? I think that is a, by accident in the break, that is the best way to start this conversation. So just reading. I have a formal def. Yeah, I I was just going to say, I found in the article itself, it says it's the assumption that people are better off as able-bodied or without physical, mental, or sensory impairments, and any deviation from this able-bodied ideal constitutes a loss. Mm. That's heavy. I I have been getting a lot of questions about this on... um, Instagram, I've mentioned ableism before, and I guess I realize that this is a, a fairly new concept to some people or haven't heard the term ableism in general. So this uh, is a good definition, I think, to help introduce us to the topic. And then I think, Marie, you said there was another way to think about it. Uh, it what was helpful for me for just considering it this from different angles is just that disability is a form of cultural diversity. So when you loop it in with all other forms of cultural diversity, you just, I just feel like it was easy just to add it in. All right, that makes sense to me. Um, And again, I think that all of, anytime you're learning, it's about opening your mind and your heart and being accepting of, you know, we're being educated on this thing for a group that I don't participate in personally. And just I love the idea that there are practical suggestions for speech therapists like myself. So I'm interested to talk more about them. Absolutely. And I, I think, the article, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say the article, you know, going through it and kind of looking down at the conclusion, they talk about how we need to, they talk about equity cannot be achieved. This is what this says. Equity cannot be achieved until stutterers receive equal opportunity in the workplace and fairly represented in the media and can stutter openly without social 
repercussions. And I think that this kind of goes with where we have been pushing ourselves in therapy when we look at students with autism or our autistic students, when we look at our disfluencies, when we look at some of these things that cannot and should not be changed, we are now have seen a big push in social language from teaching kids with autism or the autistic students. We don't longer teach masking. We teach them, hey, you can say it this way, but this is how somebody might react. Is that what you want them to do? If it's not what you want them to do, maybe we change that. Maybe we don't. When we're working with stutterers, we say, hey, when you're in this situation, your disfluency is going to get worse, but we don't teach the stutterer to stop stuttering. So I feel like this is just another nice feather in the cap to support the slow, steady push of where we have been going as therapists for the last five years, 10 years. Mm hmm. I think I think you you hit it with that, Matt, that this is that push for identity first, right? Yes. That identif mm -hmm. Identifying the person as as identifying that diagnosis or that label as part of the person mm -hmm. and not just as this disability and this problem that somehow we are part of fixing right mm -hmm. and we've seen that shift and this is years back decades back of I, I i know i've mentioned on air before but that um deaf people pulled mm -hmm. that identification of deaf a long time ago and said that is part of who i am and that is what i want to be called blind mm -hmm. people did the same thing. I am blind. Mm -hmm. I'm visually impaired. That is who I am. That's what I want to be identified as to autistic people have really pushed that. That is becoming the accepted norm in our workplaces now to call someone autistic, not to necessarily or to minimum ask, right. <laughs> that they, yes. what, how they want to be um, referred to. Like, are you an autistic person? What, what do you want me to say? Um, and then this just seems to go right along with that, that, okay, someone who stutters is a stutterer. How do, how do they identify themselves? How do they see their stutter fitting into them, their identity in their life? Mm. And I, I have treat, uh, I don't even want to say treated. I have worked with students that stutter, um, or stutters using that identity first language. Um, I, when I, my first year I worked with a fifth grader privately at his house and the parents' point of view was fix this, like completely erase the stutter. And that is not something that I was doing. And at that point, we were just working on identifying at school. The student did not stutter at all. At home, st stuttered quite a bit. And it was more anxiety inducing because of the mm. pressure that was put on at home. So we decided who, you know, we looked at the different types of fluency, enha fluency enhancing strategies. We worked through them all together. And I said, do any of these work for you? You can try them out one-on-one. -on -one. Let's try this one together. So you can use this if you feel like you would like to. They can choose to or not, but that is not our place to say, you must use this at all times and make yourself so you do not stutter at all. Because I am not a stutterer, Yet I have disfluency. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. That's right. Yeah. Mm. And I think the authors are urging us to go one step further than stuttering isn't a bad thing, right? It's confronting our own inherent cognitive biases by saying, can you think of anything positive related to stuttering? Because if you can't, mm. then you may have an implicit bias going on that you need to confront. And that's that one step after, of course, it's not a bad thing, but how many of us go further to say, could we see it as a good thing? Put ourselves in their shoes. That I feel is more difficult for us as the who have been trained to, quote unquote, fix communication mm -hmm. deficits. Um, but I was thinking about this story. I worked with a student years ago, and I might have said this on on the air at the time that we were working on getting them to decrease the anxiety associated with stuttering 
while working the cash register. Mm. And they had a call back and they worked at this restaurant where everything was kind of a goofy rhyme. And they had to call back food orders. And there were certain things that would trigger the, the disfluency. And we were working on word replacement and the cook yelled at him and said something like, I don't care that you stutter, but if you say one of those stupid words one more time, I'm reaching through here and strangling you because we were like replacing, you know, like, um, Oh, I forget what it was, but we were like replacing it with some of that slow, uh, verbalization or the, like the easy onset. And I think it was just driving the cook mad. He was like, (laughs) I am fine with you stuttering over a sound. But if I have to hear you warm your voice up like a car <laughs> one more time. <laughs> when when oh, I was in, in grad school, I was very involved in um, like stuttering support groups with adults. Um, I've been to NSA a few times, National Stuttering Association. They've been in Fort Lauderdale a few years ago. And I'm still very close to some of the people I met through the support group. And I I remember just having eye-opening experiences as there were many SLPs that attended these meetings with people of very different ages and a man who always considered himself to be a severe stutterer. He said he, that's how he described himself, a severe stutterer is a lawyer now, like has to go in front of judges and discuss this. And one of the SLPs said like, you're so brave. And he was like, Mm. I hate that. I hate that. Like, this is my chosen profession. I don't want to be called brave. This is not something that I chose to, like, I didn't choose to have a stutter. So that's part of the ableism, I think, of of like Mm -hmm. making uh, people that have a situation that's been given to them. I don't even know how to put this. I I guess uh, uh, many people that I meet with stuttering do not like to be called brave or heroes or anything like that. The adults, because they, they don't feel like that. It's just a choice that they made. And this guy enjoyed law, reading the law and being a certain type of lawyer. And that is a struggle that he goes through every day when he is in front of a judge, but it, it doesn't make him brave or a hero in his own words. And that was really something that I was like, you wow, that's very interesting. Um, Yes, because comments like that imply that you don't see the person, you just see, you see, mm -hmm. you first see their quote unquote disability and then everything else comes after that. And that's not what people want. People want you to see them and their accomplishments that don't have to do with something that they were born with, for example. Right. There was one quote that stood out to me that I thought was a call to action. So if it's okay, I'll read it. Go for it. Some therapists might worry that affecting social change is outside their scope of practice or best handled by other professionals. The ASHA scope of practice alleviates most of these concerns since the first professional practice domain listed is advocacy and outreach. So it starts with us. I really like that. We want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com and email us speechsciencepodcast at gmail. Dot com. And I feel like that is the perfect transition into our next part. And we're kind of blending this in with our uh, what's up, Asha? What's up with Asha? Uh, sometimes Asha does things that, you know, we go, hey, great job, Asha. And sometimes they do things that make us scratch our head. And uh, you may have seen this on the social medias. I sound like the 90 year old person on the ticky talkies. <laughs> But uh, there was a presentation, the Cultural Considerations in Health Equity and Dysphagia Management, and they threw up a slide asking the participants to identify and acknowledge their biases. And on the left side, there was a four-point scale that, you know, number one said, I feel I can comfortably work with this person without prejudice. And number four was, I feel bias and prejudice against this person and don't think I could work with them. And the idea on the surface was teaching SLPs to identify where their bias is to maybe make us better clinicians. However, the kerfluffle happens with the examples that they've used. They used on the right side, the potential patients include an Iranian immigrant, a Muslim man, a transgender woman, a Jewish man, 
a Hispanic Latinx immigrant, an African-American man, an alcoholic or an addict, a morbidly obese person, and a white neo-Nazi. And this has blown up pretty big over social media. And one of the articles we're going to be referencing in this is from Vivian TC. She is an SLP and also is a professor uh, at San Francisco State University teaching cultural responsiveness in speech, language, and hearing sciences to first-year grad students, as well as anti-ableism and anti-racism. And Rachel, you hit this pretty good when we were talking about this. What is the big issue about, you know, lumping neo-Nazis in with actual humans? Okay, so first of all, you have on this list, Jewish man is directly next to white neo-Nazi. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the in- I believe that the intention of this slide was to show if you are a white Christian person, what other views might be, others that you might come into contact with. So you're you're putting actually oppressed people, um, marginalized people next to white neo-Nazis based on beliefs and everything. You also have, and I think this was included, other, other types of people that someone might not agree morally with, which was transgender woman, alcoholic slash addict, or morbidly obese person. So this list, the intention was to show you might as a provider come across these patients and you're going to have to work with them based on this four point scale. Um, The problem is, is lumping the neo-Nazi in with actually oppressed, marginalized groups of people. Mm -hmm. That's, that's Mm -hmm. the problem here. Um, And it is shocking. And, I think looking at this list initially, you're like, these are like, you can see what they were trying to do. However, I'm always saying the intention does not matter. Um, It's how it came across. Um, So I am a Jewish person and seeing Jewish man listed next to white neo-Nazi as part of people that you might disagree with is not equal for me. I I hear what you're saying, Rachel, and I the part that I'm struggling with this is, is that when we look at Iranian immigrant, Muslim man, transgender woman, Jewish man, Hispanic, African American, I I have a real hard time classifying any of that into an other category first that I feel like it gives permission for somebody who feels that way to feel justified in their thoughts, if that makes sense. Hmm. And then by putting in the neo-Nazi, it almost feels like it classifies those people as just like, the level that you could disagree with an Iranian immigrant is the same that you're disagreeing with the neo-Nazi. And I feel like I don't like that image (laughs) that it could be telling some clinician that it's okay to feel that way. Does that make... And I think that sounds like especially listening to Rachel's perspective on this and, you know, me looking at that list as a white female and, and thinking where, what white neo-Nazi that's on this list Mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, I would have a problem treating this person. Um, yes, we need to treat people, but 
Well, that obviously that one stood out to all of us. I think I wouldn't serve the Nazi. Um, well, so that's the question here, and I, and I think sorry, that, sorry Michelle, I didn't no, mean to no, jump no. On I think anymore. that is the actual what this was trying to show. How do you work with someone that you are morally so against? Um, mm-hmm. And I was thinking about that Grey's Anatomy episode from years ago, yeah, where the, yeah. the oh, I remember this one, yeah, <laughs> the black doctor, Doctor Bailey, who is an incredible doctor has a patient that is a Nazi, has a big swastika on his chest. And uh, George is the resident at the time and, you know, is really saying like, you know, you got the best doctor here. And he's the patient is saying, I want to work with anyone else but her. I want to work with anyone else but her. And the question is, what do you do with them? As an SLP, when I am in front of a, a neo-Nazi, can I make that decision to not treat them because I'm, I morally disagree with them? But then they're also so, put on this list next to Jewish man, Muslim man, transgender woman, and women. That is the problem here, is including this list together, putting these on equal disagreements. And not only that, but anyone can be an alcoholic an addict Mm -hmm. or a morbidly obese person, but Mm -hmm. not everyone can be those other things. And my, I have a suspicion and I definitely would not speak for the writer of the article, but I think maybe some of this, the discomfort might come from why are we still pandering to these Mm -hmm. ideas of we're still going to um, entertain the idea that you might be uncomfortable working with someone who is just literally mm-hmm. being themselves like yeah. that's a yep. problem i think that, that we accept they that exist as, a, as they are yeah <laughs> yeah like we feel like when i say pandering i just mean like it's just it's not okay and if we keep pretending like that is okay on any level i think it just opens up an opportunity to for, to make an argument against inclusivity agreed right and i think uh, as uh, the article had said, like, we we need to treat people that need treatment. At the same time, we need to feel safe as providers. Um, and I have been in this situation treating someone with swastikas. I have been in that position. And I have, like, uh, clothing-wise, um, they were wearing swastikas. And I had told my superior at the time, I did not feel comfortable with this. And it was noted, it, I wrote something down. And I don't really know what happened after that. I believe someone else was treating them. But my comfort was, you know, uh, this, this person was being treated still. And I was not the one who needed to do this. Um, would I still have taken the the person on? I probably would have, um, even though I felt uncomfortable. And I think a lot of us are put in this position. However, this presentation that was done with this list, the intention does not, over, uh, I guess, way more than what it actually came across, which is harmful. Mm-hmm. It is harmful. Mm-hmm. Having this list when you break it down and say, these are not just people that you might disagree with. There are, there are major concerns with, with this list that was put out Um, because some of these, these people are viewed as a negative type of person, you know, when they're, when they're not. So that, that's the problem here and it's upsetting. Mm. I do. um, I wanted to read just one quote from this article or blog post that um, that will link, of course, and because I I thought of the Grey's Anatomy, right? And they reference a more recent case of a Jewish doctor, a black nurse, an Asian respiratory therapist treating a neo-Nazi with a giant swastika tattoo in an ER to save him. He had COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. And reflecting on that, you can click the link that she shares, but Um, that here's the quote from her writing that we need to serve when we need to serve. And then in bold font, which stood out to me, not just visually. um, And we also aren't emergency room clinicians responsible for a life or death critical moment. Mm -hmm. And that we too deserve well-being and safety from our oppressors. And that is, I mean, we're in a field that is 
majority white, majority straight, majority able-bodied, majority Christian, all of those things. Um, And remembering too, Rachel touched on it. And if you even look at our ASHA code of ethics, I know I, I mentioned this to you all when we were chatting before recording that we do have within our code of ethics, the right and the responsibility to take care of ourselves too. And that's emotionally, mentally, and physically, if there's ever a reason that you would be in harm treating in, in harm's way, treating a patient, we are absolutely okay to step aside and refer them to someone else. That's so well said. And to take it a step further for, I was assuming a lot, or maybe even a majority of people that don't identify with anyone as, as anything on that list is a, probably a lot more likely. And what do we do when we're coming across someone who is saying horrible things about one of these groups, right? What's our responsibility as an advocate in our field? I know I've, I've had many, many patients that, that ties have right, been... right back to the ASHA article about being an advocate, right? Teaching advocacy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to say something, and this is totally me and not anyone else on the show. So I take complete full claim and blame for the next statement. But I feel that if you, as an SLP that are serving, and you can look at this list minus the neo-Nazi and not feel that you can't serve any of these people without any sort of prejudice or bias, you don't deserve to be in our field. Mm. Like if you can look at an immigrant and not think anything other than how can I help this person finish their communication goal? If you can't look at a transgender person and say, how can I get them to where they need to be or want to be? If you can't look at somebody based on religion or addiction or disability and say, wow, how can I help them get to what they need to be? You don't deserve to be in our field. I don't care that you feel awkward or something. That should not have been your first thought. On the flip side, if you feel anything less than a four for the neo-Nazi, the I can't serve this person. I, maybe I shouldn't go that far. I, Me, I, I'm going to sit there at the four, but I'll, I'll well, stop there. I hear, I hear you, Matt, and I agree. <laughs> but I would also say, if if you feel like you are someone who would have a hesitation, would have a ooh with with a you know a person listed on this page, then take that minute to pause and ask yourself why. Yeah, that's true too. Ask mm-hmm. yourself why so that you can move beyond it and we get to what bias. Matt said to say, I, my, my role is to treat you. My role is to help you achieve your goals. Mm-hmm. And since we're making bold statements, Matt, <laughs> I would say that that's the bare minimum for you to what? not be, to, for you to not have prejudices or discriminatory behavior against someone is the bare minimum. The, yeah. the next step and our responsibility is to then also be educated and culturally responsive and be interested in learning everything we can about that person to best treat them because that's treating the whole person. I was having a conversation on Facebook um, with Ruchi and this was kind of coming up and we were talking about how I went through a training And I looked at my training room that was talking about being culturally diverse and understanding different biases. And there were no BIPOC people, no black indigenous people of color, but Hey, we're all white people learning about how to be more less bias. And everyone in the room like said, I have no biases. And I was the only one that was like, "Um, my test showed that I was a little biased in this area and a little this area. And when the, when the 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 supervisor or it's my director or whatever was everyone else was like i have no bias she was like that's a great job and then when i said i have a bias they're like how are you going to fix that and i was like <laughs> i wanted to be like i might be the only one being honest but instead it came out like i'll talk to the family more and learn more about what they need well, <laughs> oh gosh that's, that's such a- that's oh, exactly man. the problem is is especially in our fields we are a ma- majority white profession 
and 92 percent right and and we are missing that diversity in order to have these questions and reflect and to like while people of color shouldn't be the ones having to teach us these conversations mm -hmm. as white people we should have someone that is of color leading a discussion about this that can help us understand our biases in that way like we we shouldn't have um these large companies that the head of diversity is a white woman or or, or a white right. man you know that that we need to work on those areas and the resources are out there all the all the resources are there i think that it it's all up to each one of us to go ahead out and fight you can just google it you can follow SLPs of color on Instagram. They'll tell you what we should be doing. I mean, it's 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 not that hard. <laughs> right. JRC, the SLP, is one of my favorites. Um, Black Speechy. Um, there, there's so many accounts out there, um, as well as books that don't have anything to do with speech. I, I read um, via audiobook The New Jim Crow. I have So You Want to Talk About Race, which I actually bought at ASHA in 2019. Um, there's many resources for you to educate yourself. Um, the, this presentation was kind of a mess. <laughs> and I think yeah. part of that is, is because there weren't people of color, <laughs> I guess, weighing in on this or, or I don't, right. I, I don't know. It's, is that true? I guess not. No, that that's not. No, I was just curious. I don't know who the SLPs are that put oh, on the, yes, I didn't they are. It, so yes. I don't have all the full time. Yes, it is okay. by two white women. Um, oh. Yes. Okay. It, yeah, we're just not saying their name right now. Yes. But yes. Um, but uh, again, this, pre this slide specifically mentioned this list of people as I feel biased and prejudiced against this person and I don't think I can work with them. Those were mm -hmm. the people listed. So alongside of these marginalized communities, we also have neo-Nazi. Well, and that phrase right there, I think is right. the the key difference is I, I feel biased against someone or I acknowledge that I have some bias against a gr someone different from me versus saying I can't treat them or I can't work with them. And that's where I think that to me points out the issue with having neo nazi on that list. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I think back to the crying in the car scenario where Asha edited an article and made something out of nothing and it blew up. Mm -hmm. This is the actual author's presentation that they presented on. And uh, just, I don't know. I mean, Vivian TC, that's the article that we're, we're referencing. She, she wrote that we are the fourth whitest profession. And I read somewhere else. I don't know if it was in her article or somewhere else. The other three are not like, they're like trades. Um, it was We're in the first non it was in Barbara Fernandez's book. Is that also where it was too? Yep. It is 91.5% awesome. white. This is after veterinarians, farmers, mining machine operators. Hmm. So we want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speech science podcast at gmail.com. All right. After such a serious ending, I want to break the ice and I'm not going to ask you what you did, what you're going to do next week. You can say that if you would like, but I have found something that made me laugh so hard. And I want to ask you, what is your favorite comical representation of speech therapy in the media? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to play my little clip and I know that you guys can't see it, but you guys can hear it. So here we go. This is my favorite presentation. And the background is a wrestler took a chair shot to the throat. That is all you need to know is the context of this. Suffered a devastating injury to his larynx and was removed from the arena on a stretcher. World Wrestling Federation cameras were on hand as Ricky Steamboat consulted with a speech pathologist. To now is to increase the strength of your vocal cords. 
I'd like you to say this vowel after me. E. E. Okay, now, you're trying, but I want it to be more crisp. E. E. So Ricky Steamboat gets progressively more mad and then breaks the desk of what the is this just, WWE old. from the 1980s? Yeah, sounds like it. You know, but if Ricky- I know anything <laughs> about voice therapy, it's that you definitely want to just do a hard glottal attack as much right? as, as much as possible. After taking a chair shot to the larynx. Yeah. It's going to fix you right what up. They said. I think so, that, well, it's not an audio clip, but my favorite is just every stock photo of speech pathology, <laughs> which has been on, you know, jobs I've applied to, clinic websites where they pull something or somebody wants to describe what speech pathology is. And the one that always stands out to me is why are the SLPs always holding like a giant letter? <laughs> In any picture. <laughs> That's true. It's like this giant A or this giant F or this giant S. They're always holding a massive letter for some reason. Michelle, do you remember when they did the photo shoot at OU and I got put on the pamphlet? Oh, yeah, because you were a dude. Lip. They have to look like there's more I was dudes. pointing to my lips. Like that is something I do every day in therapy now. <laughs> Marie, Rachel, what is your favorite? Uh, SLP representation in the media. We have WWE. We have Michelle and her giant letter cards. What do you guys got? (laughs) Vanna White. I can't, I don't have anything specific, but I just went to a comedy show and the comedian was talking about how they had surgery and they had to have an emergency feeding tube put in. Ooh. And th- there was like a whole bit about it. And she was saying that as she was getting it put in, she was going, ah, and like <laughs> screaming and yelling. And it was like really disturbing for everybody. And I just thought to myself, I was just thinking like, wow, what are the, what's the context of like an emergency nasogastric tube? And like, is it, is it always like that? Is there a lot of yelling? And, and I just need to see this. <laughs> I saw a family member have their NG2 pulled out and the doc was like, we'll do it on three. And he went one and yanked it out. Oh, that's cruel. That's just rough, man. Rachel, your favorite SLP in the media? I don't know. Uh, I I think of uh, like the cartoons, all the um, Elmer Fudd and all of that. And I, I actually did an article back in grad school about like the use of speech impairments in the media Mm. and how they're used to like make people look weak um Mm -hmm. or have like a character flaw which was really interesting and i'm trying to think of it now i uh, again uh, gray's anatomy i'm bringing up you would always like i mean there's how many seasons 20 seasons whenever they would say all right we're calling in speech and then they would have like the stethoscope on like just a random part of their body or like the um uh, what's it called? Passy mirror, like not in the right location, or an IV that's somewhere that's not. And it, it's <sighs> they need a medical consultant on that show. I feel. <laughs> hey, I just have to say that when wrestling is the closest to uh, speech therapist being correct in the media, things have gone off the rails. Oh god, so bad. Yeah, <laughs> in our field. Asha, that's what I want. That's what I want them to do with our with our dollars that we donate every year. Just like have an educational course for the media. Yeah, I like that you say donate. Hey man, <laughs> I I'm a voluntold at my job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, our intro music tonight was "Please Listen Carefully" by Jazar, licensed under an attribution and share like license. Our bump music was the County Fair Rock, copyrighted John Deku. Find his music over at Dirt. I'm sorry, SoundCloud.com/slash/DirtDogMusic. The informed SLP used at the count by Broke for free, licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And our closing music playing right now, it's the Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod, licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. In the immortal words of Janice Wright, be a willow. The oak looks strong, but the oak cracks under pressure. The willow will bend under pressure, but returns to form and blooms the next season. For fellow willows, Michelle, Marie, and Rachel, I'm Matt. Until next week, so long, everybody. Bye. See you later. Bye.
Guys, I'm so tired. I don't know how you're awake right now in the Eastern Time Zone. <laughs> The Speech Science Podcast was brought to you by Presence Learning. Rachel, do you know anyone that is ready to future-proof their career and get their teletherapy practice up and running today? I think I know a ton of people that would be interested in that. You can with Therapy Essentials by Presence Learning. For more information and to start your free trial, visit PresenceLearning.com and click on our platform at the top of the homepage. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. And rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.